Hey, welcome to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. They're the choice of professionals since 1919. Can you believe that? 1919. It's over 100 years building tools. All right, let's get rolling. Hey, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about crate engines and why they exist and how they are here to help you as the hot rodder in your garage. Now, as most of you guys know, as you first get into hot rodding and you start you know, adding things and you slowly move up to things like nitrous and superchargers and turbos and that kind of thing, and eventually, you know, you probably get into rebuilding the actual engine and replacing hard parts and cams and pistons and that kind of thing. For the guys that grew up in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s and 80s, that was the big deal. You started tearing your motor apart and you started replacing things. And as the times have changed, less and less people are building their own engines and they just want to buy an engine from an engine builder. Chevrolet and Ford and Dodge and Honda and all of these companies have found that if they sell replacement engines, they get in on that a little bit. Now, for the longest time, all you could buy was original style engines, you know, just direct replacement engines. And it was kind of Chevrolet that first decided, hey, you know, why don't we put out these high performance crate engines and people will buy them. And sure enough, people did. And that's where the whole term crate engine came from. It comes in a crate. Now, there's different ways to get a crate engine. Sometimes it's just a short block. Sometimes it's a long block. Sometimes it's a complete runner. So you have to kind of know what you're looking for and shop around as you're in the market for a crate engine. But that's kind of where the crate engine thing came from. And, you know, it's become really a big deal in the last 20 and 30 years because, like I said, less and less people are building their own engines just because they don't have the time. There's... It's harder to find machine shops. Even the guys that are building their own engine usually aren't doing it in their own garage. They'll take their parts to an engine builder and have him do it. So that's where the crate engine came from, and that's why it's such a viable part of the hot rod world. As you can imagine, there has become competition in the crate engine world. Who has the biggest crate engine is usually the big dog on the block. (laughs) And and it's kind of the same thing that happened with the muscle car wars has now gone into the crate engine wars. I was fortunate enough years ago, uh, I got the very first 572 crate engine that Chevrolet let out the door. And it went into a truck called Copperhead. And at the time, it was the biggest, baddest crate engine that anybody had put out. And it was a 572, and it was 640 horse right out of the box. And nobody had done anything like that. And I mean, it was huge. It was, it just, it started a whole crate engine war that kind of continues to this day. And now, if you're into motors and engines at all, you can see that 600 and 700 horsepower is pretty easy to get, especially when you start talking about LS engines and superchargers and turbos and that kind of thing. You know, it's pretty easy to get over a thousand horsepower. Now, the problem with that kind of horsepower is you can't really use it on a streetcar that much. And sometimes it's not that reliable. When you're messing with twin turbos and things like that, you start to get into the, the idiosyncrasies of those particular engines. And sometimes they can be finicky. Uh, you guys that are big engine guys know that. The more the horsepower goes up, the more it becomes an issue. So what we've had in the last few years, Dodge has come out with this Hellcat Red Eye, and that's 700 and some horsepower. You can get that in a crate engine, so you Mopar guys are loving that. And there are rumors that Ford is coming out with this twin turbo Godzilla engine. (laughs) Who knows what it's going to be? You know, 800, 900 horsepower, you know, crate engine you can buy and all that kind of stuff. Well, today we just got the news a few days ago. You guys may have heard of this. Chevrolet said, screw that. We're going to beat everybody to the punch. So they have come out with a ZZ632 1,000 horsepower crate engine. Now, it's just a little over 1,000 horsepower. It's actually 1,004. <laughs> just so it's not right on the line. They went just a hair over it. It's a 632. Now, just let your head wrap around that a little bit. For you metric guys, that is over 10 liters. <laughs> 
<laughs> of displacement. That is awesome. According to Chevrolet, it, they get 1,004 horsepower and it gets 876 foot-pounds of torque. And that's on 93-pump octane gas. And it's reaching that number of horsepower at about 6,600 RPM, which is right in the pocket. And I'm looking at the dyno sheet, and they've actually done runs on this engine, over 200 runs, drag runs on a dyno with no problems. And that would be my first question to be overheating and all that other kind of stuff. Of course, it's Chevrolet, so, you know, they're doing it right. If it's anything like the 572 that I got, it's going to be an awesome engine. And that's the big question that everybody asks. Okay, is it a new block? Is it, what is it? What's, what's the basis of this thing? Of course, all of us hot rod motor guys, that's our first question. So here's what I've been able to get from Chevrolet. It is a 572 block. They punch it 40 over and then they add a longer stroke. Uh, and that's how they're getting their displacement on this thing. Now, of course, when you lengthen the stroke like that, a lot of times you have to modify the block and the rods, and they did. The real magic is that they've got these RSX symmetrical port heads. Now, these were designed by Ron Sperry, who's the guy that designed the LS1 heads. I don't know if you guys are real familiar, with, especially with the big blocks, but the ports in the heads are not all exact. And so you have some ports that are longer and shaped different and this kind of thing. So not every port is developing the same amount of horsepower. What Ron did with this design, this was the last thing he did at GM. All the intake and exhaust ports have the same length, the same volume, and the same layout. So this thing is very much spot on. This is about the best way you can do a head. This is similar to some of the stuff that John Cossey was doing with the SR71 heads that we have featured. You know, and it basically takes a complete redesign. And for you guys that, you know, are not motor builders or are up on this, basically the way it has always been is that when Chevrolet or Ford or Dodge or somebody would come out with a head, well, basically we as hot rodders would take those and we would port them to make them flow better, to get more horsepower. But you are limited by the very architecture of the heads themselves and so basically the only way to change that is to completely change the architecture of the head redesign it and of course somebody like gm can do that and the average guy can't of course that's one of the things that makes what john cossey does so amazing that's what he does too he just goes well you know i'm going to redesign the small block ford head because i'm tired of fixing the problems with it so that's basically but see he's a high-end engine builder this is chevrolet they have to make these things you know and sell them with a warranty so basically that's what they've done i'm looking at the pictures of it this thing looks pretty awesome now here's here's what the engine is it's a complete engine it's not just a long block. This thing comes with an intake. It comes with a multi-port fuel injection on it, a throttle body. It's got an air cleaner, special valve covers. You know, it's a complete crate engine. And uh, I know your next question is, what's the cost? <laughs> and of course, GM has not released the cost yet. But just as a comparison, I've run some other numbers here for you. For example, you can go to... Jags or Summit or some of these places, and you can buy a 572, which is 720 horsepower right now today for around $16,000. And that's once again, is a full crate engine, not just a long block. Or there's a, a company called Blueprint Engines that we've done stuff with on the show. They make, uh, they build great engines. They have a Pro Series 632. So they've already done this with the 572. It's 815 horsepower, 740 foot-pounds, and it's about $15,000. And it comes with a 30-month, 50,000-mile warranty. So this kind of gives you an idea what might be out there. Now, obviously, this is 800 and some horsepower, so we're talking 200 more horsepower. Because you know you always need that extra 200 horsepower. So if Chevrolet comes out with this, you know, like they say they are, It'll come out with some sort of warranty, but this gives you kind of something to compare it with. Now, if these are $15,000, my guess, this engine's probably going to be $25,000. The Build Your Own Crate LS7 that we did a few years ago for the SLC supercar I did, if you guys didn't see that on the show, GM had a program where you could go build your own LS7. And we did, and the price of that to go do that 
was about $25,000. And part of it, you know, was a little bit of the party that they throw and getting your name in the book and on the wall there at GM and all that other stuff. So the actual engine, if you just bought it outright, you know, would have been more like 20 or 18. So with all that in mind, I'm just making an assumption. I would guess that this engine's probably going to roll in fully dressed like this, probably over 20, probably about 25. If it's much more than that, they're going to have trouble selling them. And for the simple fact that I can get a thousand horsepower cheaper than that. <laughs> by throwing on some turbos or something. So if you have to have a 1,000 horsepower, this is the engine for you. Now, that brings up another thing. If you get into this engine for $25,000, let's just use that as a round number. Here's what you still need. You still need a water pump. You still need all of the accessories and pulleys. That's a, you know, a good $2,500 or more, depending on who you go with. You're going to need motor mounts. Then you're going to need headers. Then you're going to need transmission. You're probably going to need an ECM and the full computer system. It doesn't say that the motor comes with that. So there's still a lot of things to add to this, especially headers, depending on what you do. I assume that whatever headers work for a 572 would also work with this. Just buying the crate engine doesn't mean you're ready to go. And that is something that I try to always prepare people with. You know, when you buy an engine like this, there's more to it than just the cost of the engine. Okay, so the next question is, this came as kind of a surprise to me because for the last year or two, Chevrolet has been very anti-gas and very pro-electric. You know, they were the ones that were like, for the next, you know, we're going to be completely gas-free, all electric vehicles by 2035 and pushing toward that. And they haven't been talking about racing they haven't been talking about anything. So for us hot rod guys, this comes as a surprise and a nice surprise that GM, I don't know if they've realized that they cannot overlook the, the gasoline component and the hot rod component that makes GM and Chevrolet who they are. And uh, hopefully this is you know, a good sign of what's to come. For those of you that are not really paying attention to this, this is actually what we call a golden era of where all of these manufacturers are coming out with these kind of engines. You know, when you think about this, a thousand horsepower on pump gas on a naturally aspirated engine, that is, that is going some. If you look back in the history of when, you know, as cars were coming together and guys were building hot rods, man, when I was going to school, I had 400 horsepower under the hood, and I could outrun just about anything on the road. That was a lot. You know, of course, it was all cast iron heads and this kind of thing. And, and we have made so many leaps and bounds forward in technology, you know, with aluminum heads and then the ports and then the LSs and the, the Coyotes and the Hemis. You know, it's easy to get this kind of power. The big problem now is controlling it. And that brings up a, a whole nother question. Do you really need over a thousand horsepower in a streetcar? And will you be able to use it? Well, no, you won't be able to use it. You'll be able to handle it, hopefully. But man, you lay down onto something like this, you better be holding on. And you better have built the car to handle it or you'll twist that car up into a pretzel. I've seen it happen. I've seen welds break left and right. I've been in many cars that were not properly built uh, for the power and the torque that they had. And it is not a pretty picture. And you're lucky if you can walk away from them usually. Now, here's another thing to think about when you are looking to get a crate engine. Usually when you buy a new engine like this, this is considered a brand new engine, which means if you put it into an older vehicle, you have to set it up with the proper catalytic converters and emissions to make it legal like a new vehicle. And that is where you get into a lot of stuff. Now, that is when you're shopping for a crate engine, that is why a lot of the manufacturers will say for off-road use only. That means that it is set up for a race car or some sort of something that is not going to be street legal. And those are the kind of engines that you can get and you can put into something that is older, that is not under a lot of requirements. But for example, if you take this 632 and you put it into a newer Camaro, 
Well, you're going to have to saddle it up with all of the emissions to make that thing pass emissions, like a new vehicle. A lot of people don't realize that. You take this engine and put it into a really cool kit car, and they'll go, okay, what, what engine? Oh, you have a brand new engine. Well, it's got to you know, be set up with modern regulations and catalytic converters, and you have to hit modern emissions. That's a real pain in the butt. So as you're shopping for your crate engine, make sure that you don't bind yourself up with something that you have to pay all this extra money to put catalytic converters and things on if if it's not you know what you're building it's kind of hard to put catalytic converters on a gt40 if that's what you're building and that gets into a whole bunch of legal stuff too you just you got to check your local laws you've got to check what your regulations are in your state when you're getting ready to title things and and build custom vehicles so make sure you're doing your homework because you want to be able to drive them you don't want to sit and look at the engine on the engine stand going man Sure would be nice to put that in something. <laughs> I am already thinking of the vehicles that I could put this in. And don't think for a second that my name is not the first one in line, man. It would be awesome if I could get one of the first engines you know, to put in a project. And if I do, I promise you, you will see it on gears going into something cool. Anyway, if you're in the market for a crate engine, they're out there. All right, I've got a question for you guys. What is the most important tool in your garage? All right, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Come on. Give me, yeah, all right. All right, well, it's probably the one you use the most. And that would be your sockets, your ratchets, your screwdrivers, and your wrenches. And if you want quality tools there, you probably ought to check out somebody like Cornwell. Now, granted, you can get some cheaper tools, and honestly, there's a place for those, those ones that you want to bend up and heat and go into certain places and those screwdrivers you don't mind screwing up. <laughs> well, that's where you get the cheap stuff. But if you want real quality tools that are going to last and have a warranty, that's where you need to check out somebody like Cornwell. They've been doing it forever. And believe me, you do get what you pay for. Hey, you know, a few weeks ago, we um, talked about Jerry Reed a good bit, my relationship with him and how we got to know him just before he died. I was talking about what a huge musical influence he was on me, as well as just Nashville and just the music world. A lot of you guys have wondered, you know, what was that and, and how did he play and all that kind of stuff and what made it different? So we're going to kind of go into that a little bit, kind of give you an illustration of... <laughs> Jerry's playing and, and what he did and really what his influences were. One of the biggest things about Jerry was that he was so funky oriented and he played, you know, a lot of sevenths, you know, for you music guys, you know what I'm talking about. He just had a real groove to him. Of course, his singing and his, he was funny and his timing was just amazing. One of the biggest things people don't realize about Jerry is he played with a thumb pick. I'm a flat picker. So those of you that uh, are music oriented, uh, you know that uh, flat pick is just something that you hold between your index finger and your thumb on your strumming hand. And usually if you're a flat picker, that means you just kind of do single note kind of things, you know, that kind of stuff. Now most people, if you're strumming along, you'll do kind of what we call an alternating bass with a strum. So I know this is a audio medium and not visual, so I'm going to try to walk you through it. So you'll be like doing this kind of thing, you know. See, so I'm, I'm, I'm hitting with a downbeat. So here, this is basically what I'm doing. And then, you know, you put some sevenths on there and it sounds good. So you're like a... That's kind of a Jerry Reed feel to it, but... But that's kind of your, your basic thing. Now what Jerry did is that he also added, and he actually had an instrumental called the claw, where he would reach down with his middle finger and his third finger and pluck up or play an alternative melody while he was picking with his thumb, or in my case, a flat pick. Now a lot of you guys might be thinking, well that's, that sounds like a Chet Atkins style. No, Chet Atkins style was a little bit different. It was a lot smoother and a lot more predictable. For example, you know, this is like a Chet Atkins thing. Here's 
hear how smooth it is, you hear the alternating bass, and you hear the alternative melody going in there. What Jerry did, and, and Chet was the one that brought Jerry to town. I think Jerry was trying to play like that, <laughs> but he added that raw thing, so he would do more of a pluck, and it would sound something like this. <laughs> spice it with really quick riffs. And as he would put that stuff in there, <laughs> you had that funky thing going on there. Now, a lot of your country players now, what we call this double stop chicken picking stuff, this um, like... Uh That's all based off of that Jerry thing. And a lot of us now, we pick like that, and they call it a hybrid picking, which is basically, I use it like a set of flat pick and my fingers at any given time. Another person that has done really well with this is Brian Setzer. He'll roll into things like that. If you'll watch his right hand, he'll go from a thumb pick or a flat pick and throw in some fingers from time to time. A lot of people play with that way now. But Jerry's kind of the one that did that, and he's the one that kind of got that started. And so kind of the modern, chicken picking thing that you hear Brad Paisley doing and Keith Urban they owe a lot of that to Jerry Reed now for those of you that are wondering that have just got to know uh, the guitar that I'm playing here is this McPherson that you've seen on the show just a great sounding little acoustic I hope it comes across well they're kind of weird looking but man I'll tell you what these guys really know how to do the wood on them so if you're looking for a good acoustic try one of these McPhersons I think you will be impressed. That little song that I was playing is something I just called it uh, <laughs> kind of a little tribute thing that I wrote to Jerry and I'm just calling it Geriatric. <laughs> song! There you go, Jerry. It's for you, man. All right, that's it for today. Once again, we're brought to you by Cornwell Tools. Have a great day and get out there and work on something. <laughs>